So hi, I'm Linda. I am a design manager at Lyft. We are known for being very pink. Um, I've been a design manager at Lyft for around a year now, and in that time, the team has been working on a lot of really exciting things. So we just announced our redesign of the Lyft passenger and driver app this week, um, and this is something that we're really, really proud of because it's been in need for a refresh for a while now. And um, during my tenure at Link, Link, Lyft, um, I've really watched the team grow from less than 20 people to 80 people. And within product design, the team that I manage is called Core Design. So we're seven people, um, and that's our dog, Pronto. Uh, she rides motorcycles, and she wears bandanas all the time. And so our team is really, I, I love it. It's so unique. I think everyone specializes in such a different area. The things that our company does, or sorry, our group does is illustration, 3D, sound, prototyping, motion. And of course, we work on design systems. And our biggest product is the Lyft product language, or LPL for short. This is our design system. And fun fact, this is Lyft's first design system. Um, and the reason why it exists and the reason why our team exists is definitely in response to just the sheer growth of the company as a whole, as well as us trying to kind of set up a higher bar of quality and consistency in our design process. So today you've already heard some like super amazing talks about scaling your design system and prototype prototyping and kind of like how to get it off the ground. What I would love to do is take us more on a deep dive into a topic that we're probably all super familiar with as designers uh, and really as human beings, but maybe not experts in, which is color. Uh, I love color, as you can see. And so I wanna talk about color, but I also wanna talk about how to create a comprehensive color system inside of your design system. Color is super fun, it's really nice to look at, uh, but it's very complex. And that's because color intersects so many different fields. It intersects culture, emotion, psychology, math, science, and current new technology. So for example, what do you think of when you look at this color? So, Oh, okay, no, no, yeah, go for it. <laughs> Who said that? Oh, yeah, uh, I agree with you. For me, it feels like, oh, this looks like danger or blood or violence, uh, or I'm just a very morbid person. <laughs> but a part of me, I mean, I'm Chinese, and if you grew up in China, for example, you could look at a color like this, and you might think, oh, duh, this is happiness or good luck or money. Um, so we all kind of bring our sort of past associations and history to the colors that we look at. In addition, colors are super important to all of the brands that we work on. Uh, so even without any logos or labels, I think you can look at these colors and know exactly which companies I'm referring to. So on the left, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, Lyft, although I, we are on LinkedIn, so I don't know, but. <laughs> yeah, good job, yeah, exactly. And there's a large you know, psychological connection to these colors as well. So if you look, you know, do the colors on the left, do they feel more reliable, more mature? Do the colors on the right, they feel more energetic or fun, and why is that? And then on the flip side, color is super technical. So I'm not gonna get into color science in this talk, but just to say that there are really infinite ways to model, measure, and mix colors together. And where that really comes to a head for us as designers is that we have to take into account what our colors look like on the hardware that we're designing for. And our industry does not make this easy for us. <laughs> So every screen and device that we design for emits light in a different way. So your designs on an iPhone 10 look completely different than on an iPhone 5. 
Has anyone ever tried their designs out on a Pixel 2? Yeah. Those, you, if you have not, you should do it because those colors are whack. <laughs> And that kind of leads to this nonsense, where we as designers are expected to navigate all of these hundreds of different color space profiles and sort of know how to apply that to our designs. So really, color systems, they are incredibly hard to build. Because they have to have emotion, because they have to reflect your brand, because they also have to be usable for UI and the hardware, and because you want to make your colors accessible to a universal audience. So how do you do this? How do you take the approach of creating a color system in the first place? Well, for our team, we really had to turn this into a product design problem. And so usually when you think of color, you think of it as a visual exercise. But for us, we really needed to have an understanding of who our user base was, what our end goals were, and how we were going to me measure success. So as a manager, I make a lot of product specs. Uh, this is what a product spec would look like for something like a color system. So for us, our users are our internal design uh, teams who work with us day to day and are the, ultimately the users of our color system. The requirements are the things that I mentioned before. It has to be lifty. Colors have to meet legibility standards. They have to have understandable usage, consistent vocabulary, and they have to be scalable for the future. And you have to validate and measure your success in the same exact way that you would do when building any type of product feature. And for us, that means using research, using prototyping, um, and measuring the adoption of your system. So I'm going to take you through how our team went about approaching our color system um, in the four chronological ways that we tackled it, naming, picking, accessibility, and scaling. OK, so color naming. We're going to play a little game here. So just shout it out when you think you know the answer. What color is this? Purple? In in indigo? What was it? Blurple, anyone? No. <laughs> it's actually mulberry, or at least that's what we call it at Lyft. I have never encountered a mulberry in real life. <laughs> OK, next one. What color is this? Oh, carnation pink? All of you are wrong. It's Dusty Rose, too. <laughs> OK, let's try the inverse. What color do you think this represents? Does someone say green? <laughs> Is this what you expected? No. Yeah. Doves are white. <laughs> You're right. This person was definitely thinking of a pigeon. <laughs> okay, multiple choice time. What UI does time to leave color get applied to? Silence? Yeah, I don't know either. I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> and then this is the final question. This is very hard. Which one of these is lift pink? Seven? OK. I am, you're, you're probably the closest, so I'm very mean. None of these are lift pink. <laughs> but they all existed in our code base, and they were being used across our UI. <laughs> so that was a little bit of the hot mess that we were in before our color system. And this is what it looked like in practice. So in product design, we were using different naming schemes for even our own colors. We had UI pink, we had gray seven, we had error red, and they all lived side by side together. <laughs> At the same time, iOS was using a completely different naming structure with completely different colors. And for whatever reason, they were using like irrational numbers to describe their colors. 
<laughs> I don't know. And so iOS was different than design. Android was different than iOS. And web was different than Android. So we, we saw this and we were like, OK, before we can tackle anything, we have to figure out how to even be able to communicate with each other. So we needed a single color vocabulary if we were going to have any long-term consistency. And I think this is something that Mike touched on as well. So what did we do? We started with the semantics. And I think it's par for the course that any good design system solution starts with the semantics. And thinking about color as a product design problem, we really were trying to figure out who our users were. And one of our biggest user base is our engineers. And our engineers work in almost text-only environments. So we knew we needed color names that could communicate what they are without someone having to see them. So at that time, uh, our brand creative team was also in the middle of a redesign. And they had met, made a set of secondary colors that they were using for print and illustration. Um, so these are where the names, I don't know why I didn't include the names, where the names like Dusty Rose and Desert and Aquamarine and Sky came from. And at first, our team was like, great. you know, They already did the work for us. We'll just use their names. But I think we quickly realized that what their problem is and what I pro our problem is uh, were completely different sets of problems, sets of users. For them, they were trying to be evocative. You know, like when you go down the makeup aisle and all the lipstick is like sexy pink and like people are trying to really kind of entice you with the color names. But for us, we needed to make sure that the language that we were using was as straightforward and clear as possible. So we decided to diverge very purposefully on this. This was a moment of inconsistency that we were OK with. So what we ended up doing was we took brands' original hues and we added a few more to make 16. Um, so that was just so that we could be inclusive of all of the colors you know, around the spectrum that aren't just Roy G. Biv. And we set up a couple of requirements. We said, OK, we're not going to use any abstract names, and we're not going to use long names. Because when things are long, people start to abbreviate them. So we looked at a lot of historical naming of colors, tried to come up with universal topics that people were familiar with. This was really hard, because everyone comes from a different cultural background. We had a very difficult time with the word tangelo, which is between red and orange. Uh, tangelo is a mix between a tangerine and a grapefruit. Today you learned. <laughs> <laughs> and that caused like the red-orange debate of 2018, where everyone hated the word tangelo. They thought it was like jello. I thought it looked like the Pokemon. Like, no one knew how to spell it. No one knew what it was. And so one of our iOS engineers who works on the partner team to us, client libraries, he came up with the name Sunset. And we were like, oh, OK, that makes so much sense. Everyone's experience a Sunset. And even though, I mean, technically, Sunsets can be different colors, at least like the emoji of it is red and orange. So that's sort of the process that we took with every single one of our color names. It's not perfect, but it definitely solved our user problems of being short syllabled and direct and universal. So we had our hues. And then the way that we decided to describe the shades of every color was to use modifiers. So zero being the lightest version of that color, 100 being the darkest. And so with that, hues plus modifiers, we went from a situation like this to a naming convention like this. And I think if you just take a moment to just picture what those colors might look like, the expectations actually match up pretty well to the reality. Cool. OK. So we had our vocabulary figured out. And next, we needed to tackle actual color palette generation. So this is the usual process, and this is one that I'm super guilty of, uh, where I kind of just take a color picker and click around till the colors look pretty, and then call it a day. 
So there are two big problems with this. Uh, the first one is that I made that using my eyeballs, and my eyeballs see things differently than your eyeballs do. The second one is that this process is not scalable. How would I even go about telling another designer, "Hey, add three more colors to this design system"? How would they even go about it? The process all came from inside of my head, and I didn't really even understand why my decisions came from. And so, when there's no process behind the decisions that you're making, and no way to communicate that to another designers, you don't have a design system. So these are the things that we really wanted to make sure that our、uh, color system took over. That we wanted it to have some logic to be able to communicate to other designers on our team. We wanted a global lift palette, something that was really large that we could pick a small subset of, and that was because our product needs are always growing. Lift as a company is always growing, and we wanted a color system that could grow with it. And so there are a couple of ways that you can start off by systematically, programmatically creating、uh, color palettes. So you can take a color like that blue in the middle, and you can step it to black, and then step it to white. Or you could take a color and take another hue, and put equal amounts of those colors over a spectrum. And so this is a way that we thought, like, oh, this is nice. This is a really great start to how we can programmatically generate our colors. But unfortunately, this linear process was just not working for us, and that's because of science. So, there's this thing called the Weber-Fechner law, apparently,、uh, which kind of states that if you go through a color from light to dark in equal steps, your eyeballs don't actually perceive that difference as equal. So it's almost like a law of diminishing returns as you get to the darkest color, and you can see the difference between the first two bands that look really different and the last two, which look almost exactly the same. And this effect is also different on different hues. So the same thing happens、uh, with blue and yellow, but they look completely different. And that's because, as I was saying, color is very complex. It's not linear and it's not 2D. It's this 3D shape and it's very weird looking. Our color needs as designers are also not linear. And what I mean by this is that. If you take a look at the context in which we use color in our UI, we actually, as designers, weigh very heavily towards the lighter shades of every color, and that's because we have to show things like placeholders, disabled, inactive states, touchdowns, and those all have to be differentiated enough between each other and between a normal state. So.、Uh, Kevin, who he didn't want me taking his picture, and I don't have Memoji yet, so this is as good as it's going to get.、Uh, so he was on our team, and he kind of was the one who realized all of these issues of programmatically generating your own colors. So he actually came up with a super clever, intricate ways,、uh, intricate way to tackle creating UI-centric color palettes programmatically, and that was by using math and by using Bezier curves. So in Framer, he created an algorithm that pulls any color across a curve for hue, for saturation, and for luminosity.、Um, there's a little bit of science here, but the way that I wanted to describe it is just the fact that if you use a curve, any color on that curve looks like it has a relationship to every other color on that curve. And this is sort of like the same reason that Apple decided to smooth out the corners on all of their icons, because it makes the entire unit look more like one set. And so, with these curves, what we were able to do is just really tweak out, you know, the the muddy colors that you tend to get in the middle, and grab those kind of. If you look at that luminosity chart, grab those colors that were on the lighter ends of the spectrum before you hit dark. So that it could be more usable for UI, and so this is sort of like the before and after. So on the left is what you get with a linear progression, and then on the right is what you get using our algorithm. And we just thought this was 
amazing because it came out with colors that we could actually use in interfaces. No one needs like a hundred shades of things that look almost black. At the same time, we still really wanted to retain that brand energy, that brand feel. So we took brands' primary and secondary palettes and ran them through our algorithm. And the output of that was what we called spectrum. So as you can see, it's got all of the colors that were in the original uh, brand palette, but it's also got darker, more usable colors that are still related to those original brand colors. And we've got you know, our big, super poppy pink. And so now you're probably looking at this saying like, oh, Lyft's color palette is just the rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> But this was just our global palette. So what we really wanted to do is, what we did here, is take a portion of that and say, okay, for this year, this is sort of like Lyft's color palette, and this is what we're using in our UI. And so I want to touch on a point of accessibility. And if there's one thing to take away from this talk, it's that accessibility and accessible colors don't mean ugly colors. I know accessibility, accessibility is something that is really hard and, and teams struggle with it all the time. Our team struggled with it. And I do think that there is a sentiment out there that if I make designs accessible, you know, my designs might look pretty bad. And I just simply think that's not true because accessibility just means legibility. And in my personal opinion, something that is hard or hurts my eyes to see or something that I can't even see in general is just inherently less beautiful than things that aren't. So we take accessibility very importantly at Lyft. And it's also because we have a very specific use case. Half of our customers are actually drivers. And our drivers mount their phones really far away from themselves. They're driving in rain, they're driving in sunshine, they're driving at night. So there's a lot of context um, that, you know, that our UI has to live in for them. And so we want to make sure that they're as legible and as high contrast as possible because this is honestly like our driver's livelihoods. So in terms of color, what that meant for us was that we had a goal, all of our colors will be level AA color contrast acceptable, which means a color contrast of 4.5 uh, to 1. And the great thing about math is the fact that you can bake in this stuff programmatically. So if you look on the right of the slide, you can see those white and black numbers. That was us calculating what the color contrast ratios of those colors were on black and on white. And we made sure that we set a parameter that one of those numbers can never hit, or sorry, both of those numbers can never hit underneath 4.5. So this is where we came up with our accessible pink color, which is pink 60. Um, and I've been using it throughout this presentation, and I don't think it is any less beautiful than our lift pink. And so to make this consistent across the board, we kind of came up with this universal rule. Everything 60 and below is accessible on white. Everything six, uh, 50 and above is accessible on black. In addition to that, we also tested out all of our colors in context on the devices that we would actually see them on. Because it's one thing to see it on your screen, and it's another thing to see it out in the real world. And you can just see right here the difference between these three devices. It's kind of nuts. Um, and this was fantastic because we really tweaked the parameters of our curves through testing it out in the real world. And then the last thing that we did for color contrast was that we decided collectively we are going to support P3 wide color gamut, which is a fancy way of saying that the newer devices like iPhones, MacBooks, and a lot of computer displays are all wide color gamut displays. So they, have, they show a larger range of colors, and they make your colors more vivid. So across the board, I highly recommend this. This is what we did at Lyft, and this is supported in Sketch. Okay, 
And so the reason why we invested so much in the methodology, in the math of building out our color system is because we really wanted to make sure that it could grow with our team and our product. Using an algorithm meant that we have a repeatable process for generating colors that we can teach across designers. This is Lyft's uh, color pink for brand over the years. So you can see that even in the span of three years, they changed it three times. And we need to make sure that our color system would be able to be flexible enough to support the next rebrand. So this is our product spectrum for 2018. If we need to add or you know, erase a color from our UI, we can simply choose from that same global set. If none of those colors are working for us, we can revisit the curve that we have and add in more data points. And we've already done this for a lot of our UI as well. And then if all of a sudden Lyft is like, hey, we're no longer a pink company, we're a green company, hopefully uh, our color system is set up enough so that we have the ability to adapt to those big changes. And then my last point is really just about adoption, adoption, adoption. Uh, so for me, <laughs> this has always been the case. If you build it, they will not come. Um, and so just like if someone came over to you and was like, I have a better version of English, use it. Like that's never going to happen. You really have to be incredibly active in getting your design system in front of other people. So when we were finished up with color, the team did just as much, if not more work, to evangelize it and to get in front of other teams so that everyone could be fluent in this language. Lindsay, our design system lead, made a ton of documentation about color best practices, when to use it, and how much. We did a lot of brown bags, a lot of all hands, and the great thing is that we utilize our engineering partners, Kathy and Sam, to do engineering iOS and Android presentations on color. Uh, Shannon, our UX prototyper, and Kevin also made this amazing sketch plugin, which puts in our color system right into Sketch's color picker so that it makes it incredibly easy for a designer to adopt those colors and their designs and also for engineers to be able to see exactly what colors we're using. So the last thing that we did to make sure that it was a seamless adoption was that Sam on our iOS team wrote a script that pushed all of that nonsensical color, naming conventions, et cetera, into the closest color in our new system. So within one fell swoop, you know, our entire system was actually adopted in the code base. So that was our approach. Our approach does not have to be your approach. So I am not suggesting that we all go out there and programmatically have to generate all of our colors. What I am saying, though, is that there is always a way to take a systematic approach to every aspect of your design language, no matter how subjective or how visual it might feel. So the next thing that our team is doing is that we're working on our illustration system, on our sound system, and we're going to take the same kind of universal approaches that we did with color and apply it into those aspects of our design system. And this is really all just a culmination of saying, treat your design system like a product design problem. It will make your decisions so much easier and then advertise the crap out of it. Thank you.